At the, at the moment, the next talk is a mystery talk because we don't actually have a title for it, which is, it seems to have become lost somewhere in the electronic ether. Oh, black hole, black hole births in real time. And this is Samya Nisanke from Radboud University. Thank Over you very to you. much. Thank you. So, thank you very much to the organisers for giving me the opportunity to talk, to talk about my research today. Um, I'll just say a few words about myself. My name is Samaya Nisanki. I'm an excellence fellow at Radboud University, Nijmegen in the Netherlands. I've just come back to Europe actually after six years in North America, so it's really a great privilege to be here. Um, I also, and also speaking in my hometown, um, I have to say a big thank you actually, and it was a pleasant surprise this morning when I came to today's meeting to see my A-level physics teacher, Charlie Barkley, here. So thank you very much, Charlie. You you're, you are one of the reasons why I'm here so, today and about my actual the research I'm working on as well as a sort of recap, an overview about the meeting we had today, the very exciting meeting on surveying the transient universe. And so my re research really focuses on understanding black hole births. And this is really a fundamental question in astrophysics today since we know that gravity drives the evolution of the universe at all scales. But we still have very open-ended questions, still very many unanswered questions um, about how astrophysics works in the strong field gravity regime. <coughs> now we're actually at a very unique moment in time where we can actually, thanks to new observatories and tools, we can actually witness black holes being born in real time thanks to two factors. Number one, the tremendous improvements on the instrumentation side of gravitational wave detectors, such as LIGO, which I'll be talking about. And secondly, because of the tremendous advances, and we've actually entered this new era of time domain electromagnetic um, astronomy, where we're essentially not just looking at the universe in single snapshot images, but we're really actually monitoring the universe, creating a sort of movie of the universe. And so it's really the convergence of these two that allow us to answer this central question, how do black holes form? And as was recapped in today's meeting, we're doing so by combining three different, three sort of modern pillars, I guess, in astronomy, general relativity, computational astrophysics, and transient astronomy. And by answering this central question, how do black holes form, we also are able to push forward the frontiers of many other diverse fields, such as stellar evolution. Can we understand the fate of compact object systems? Cosmological probes, can we use these systems in some sense as standard <clears throat> candles to actually measure the expansion history of the universe? As well as, what can we actually say about cosmic enrichment? So, I will now focus, part one of this talk will really focus on the astrophysics of these sources that we're all trying to use to study black hole formation. And so the really exciting aspect of this work is that we're really focusing in the last stages in the lifetime of compact object binary systems. And by compact, I'll be talking about neutron stars and black holes and these are the most extreme gravity objects that we know of in the universe. Neutron stars, I remind you, have masses 1.4 to 2 solar masses and are extremely, have really small radii, about 12 kilometer radii. And so they're extremely dense objects. Actually, for, at these densities, you could actually pack the entire of humanity into a sugar cube. So just imagine, so really, you know, these really are fascinating objects. They have huge magnetic fields, and they can also, we think that, we believe that their, their centers comprise exotic equations of states. So they're really very interesting objects. Black holes, on the other hand, they span a diverse range in masses, two to 10 to the nine solar masses, and they have such strong gravitational um, fields that they essentially warp space-time, making them black to us within some event horizon. And they are, in some sense, the simplest objects that we know of in the universe. You can characterize them entirely thanks to the no-hair theorem, 
by their masses and their spins. Now from astrophysics, I'm getting a bit confused with these various laser pointers, but from astrophysics, we know from binary stellar evolution that most pairs of massive stars end their lives in these kind of systems, neutron star, neutron star, neutron star, black hole systems. But what remains remarkable to me is that we still actually don't know what are their outcomes. Do they merge? Do they accrete? Do they form relativistic jets? Or do they actually explode? And even more fundamentally, we don't actually know whether they form black holes or magnetars, neutron stars with extremely high magnetic fields. So it's a, really, it's a real mystery as to you know, what happens, what are their evolutionary fates. What we do know is that during this very messy merger, we do expect some matter to become unbound, gravitationally unbound, and thrown out of the system. And it's this delayed matter outflow that will create electromagnetic emission, typically at these time scales, um, from the system. And it's that that we're planning to actually detect. Now, from radio observations, we know that these systems exist. Tight neutron star binaries exist. And they're essentially orbiting or inspiring each other in ever-shrinking orbits due to the emission of gravitational radiation, which is essentially carrying energy and angular momentum away from the system. <laughs> and in the last couple of orbits, we expect these systems to actually be so bright in gravitational radiation, so about 10 to the 57 ergs per second, which I remind you is a quadrillion the luminosity of our sun, or even a factor of 10 the luminosity, if you sum all the visible galaxies that we see. So they're extremely bright in gravitational radiation, very, very bright and very interesting. And I'll remind you that gravitational waves are an intrinsic prediction of general relativity, and they're essentially the perturbations in the fabric of space-time. And they're generated <coughs> by accelerating quadrupole moments. So quad, uh, essentially analogous in some sense to electromagnetism, where you're essentially detecting dipole radiation from <laughs> accelerating charges. In G GR, we expect to actually detect gravitational radiation, which is sourced by this matter-energy distribution. Now, importantly, they're coherent. So this is why, in some sense, we sometimes talk about hearing the sound coming from gravitational waves. And they're weak, which is both a blessing and, dis um, blessing and problem for us on Earth, and the blessing in the sense that they allow us to actually bulk the dynamic properties of the source, because they're so weakly interacting. But it's actually a curse in some sense, because this is why it's been so difficult to actually detect these um, gravitational waves. And in gravitational wave astronomy, the observable is called the gravitational wave strain, and this is the dimensionless sort of amplitude, a time-dependent time varying amplitude, which has a one over distance to the source dependence. Now, this is really important because, remember, in, when we measure um, electromagnetic radiation, we're typically measuring the flux, the intensity, and that has a one over R squared dependence. Now, for neutron star binary systems that I've been talking about, due to their quadrupolar nature, the frequency of the gravitational wave is given at zeroth order by, the orbital, by twice the orbital frequency of the system. And this makes them amongst the most numerous and most eagerly anticipated sources that we expect to detect by advanced versions of kilohertz gravitational wave detectors such as advanced LIGO, which will actually start going, taking science this summer. It's a tremendously exciting um, time. And um, essentially, these gravitational waves will be acting as tidal forces, stretching and squeezing the, inter the distances between the interferometer as the wave passes through the Earth. And this dimensionless wave stream for astrophysical systems that we expect will be about 10 to the minus 21. So for the kilometer lengths of about four kilometers, 
the delta L, the change in arm length that we're trying to detect, is 10 to the minus 18 meters. That's a thousandth the, the size of a nucleus of an atom. And that is really why it's been so challenging to actually reach that instrument precision. And come the 2020s, we actually expect to have a worldwide network of these kilometer length gravitational wave interferometers acting. Now, for the question that we're interested, neutron star, neutron star mergers are guaranteed kilohertz gravitational wave sources. And this is really important to bear in mind because we know that they exist. And this is really exemplified by the indirect detection of gravitational radiation from the Hulse-Taylor pulsar binary over decades of observations, very, very careful monitoring of the orbit, and we, which actually confirmed general relativity's prediction of the loss of energy and angular momentum in the system to 0.4%. So we know gravitational wave radiation exists, and we know that they come from neutron star, neutron star binary systems. <coughs> One of the big challenges is, though, that we only have a small sample of known neutron star, neutron star systems in the galaxy. And we have yet to detect a neutron star black hole system. And this is really one of the holy grails of radio astronomy. And this results in the three orders of magnitude in the actual merger rate of these systems. So it's about one to a hundred per million years per Milky Way equivalent galaxy. So it's, you know, this has been one of the big challenges, but gravitational wave detections will actually really pinpoint this down, this uncertainty. And so, as I mentioned, we're at this incredibly exciting moment where we can actually detect gravitational radiation from the tens of thousands of orbits before they actually merge with interferometers such as LIGO and actually also measure their post-merger electromagnetic radiation with new time domain observatories. And I will talk a little at the end about this very exciting wide field optical survey that I'm, I'm involved with at Radboud to build. So to actually detect both of these. And so from, from the gravitational wave measurements, we can learn about the sources, dynamic and fundamental properties and from their electromagnetic radiation, we can really learn orthogonal and complementary information about the source's environment and their energetics. And it's only by combining these two orthogonal probes that we can actually start to pinpoint the um, fundamental characteristics as well as the ecology and the demographics of these sources for the first time and actually witness the formation of black holes and magnetars, these extreme gravity objects. Now, you'll remember I talked about this 10 to the minus 18 meters that we're trying to measure with instruments such as advanced LIGO. And this has two important consequences. Firstly, you know, you have to understand your instrument noise very well. And I, I should just mention, for instance, tumbleweed plays a very important, understanding tumbleweed near your gravitation wave interferometers plays a very important role because you really do have to try and get that precision of 10 to the minus 18 meters. The second aspect is that we have to know what we're looking for. What are the predictions of the gravitational wave strain? And so for in-spirals, we call this, this um, so-called chirp. These are the predicted signals because of the ever-increasing amplitude and frequency of the source. And so shown here is a snapshot, the gravitational wave strain as a function of time for an in-spiraling binary. And what I want you to take away is it's extremely rich in structure. <coughs> And encoded in that, this signal, in this chirp, there's an incredible amount of information about the source. And so this actually has been extremely well modeled over the last couple of decades using weak field perturbation theory of Einstein's field equations. And this is exactly the templates that we're using to actually try to detect these gravitational waves. So by essentially matched filtering, your chirp with your detector output from these interferometers, you can extract this whole host of information. So you really get exquisite measurements on the masses. So depending on the signal to noise ratio, on the masses of your neutron stars or your black holes, you can get masses one to a few percent. 
spins to few to tens, tens of percent. And remember, they are not plagued by the normal systematics that we have when we're trying to measure these quantities using X-ray binaries, and et cetera, model-dependent <coughs> quantities. And these we can measure to such a good precision because they appear in the gravitational wave phase and we're really tracking these thousands of orbits just before they merge. Now, for the geometric properties, such as whether the binaries face on or where it is in the sky, as well as the luminosity, luminosity distance, strong degeneracies exist between these parameters. So what I'm showing here is a simulation for a face-on binary, so it's exactly, its orbital angular momentum is faced directly at us, and this is the cosine inclination as a function of the distance for this binary, which is marked on the, its true position is marked with this red cross. And what I want you to take away are these large banana error bars <laughs> because of the strong degeneracy between these parameters that appear in the, that amplitude of the gravitational wave chirp. And this results in measurement errors of about 20% in the distance for this face on binary. And it's for this reason, partially for this reason, that we actually want to measure electromagnetic counterparts in emission from these systems. And so at the moment, there are four counterparts that we consider and we predict. Number one is a prompt radio emission that happens just before merger due to some relativistic plasma outflow. The second is a short gamma ray burst. So essentially here, the model is that you have some accretion from some centrifugally supported disk. This is our remnant black hole, which is powering some relativistic jet. At longer time scales, we expect to see these optical counterparts, which we call kilonova. They're basically mini supernova like transients, and they're powered by our process, rapid neutron capture nuclear synthesis happening in their ejector. And the fourth counterpart are these slow radio remnants, sort of supernova-like remnants that we expect to see much later at years' time scales. And what I'd really like to stress is that they all appear at different time scales which correspond to the different microphysics at play to cause their radiation. So this is on the minutes to the merger, the couple of seconds. <coughs> um, here we're talking about days in terms of detecting them, and here we're talking about po potentially months to years. So it's a really... Uh, you really want to measure all of these counterparts. And the other thing I'd like to stress is that we have ob measured many, many, many short GRBs. We have about 40 where we know where their host galaxies are, yet we still don't know whether they do come from these neutron star binary systems. And excitingly, a UK-led discovery of the first kilonova candidate was seen coincident with a short gamma ray burst a couple of years ago by Neil Tambia. So, from the electromagnetic signature, you get a whole host of other information, um, including, for instance, the nucleosynthesis that is happening in this ejector that's being emitted, is thrown out, flung out, as well as key information about the environment. <laughs> and this really is the reason why we want to combine and understand what you are, what you can uh, what you can obtain from each channel, from the gravitational wave chirp as well as from the electromagnetic signature. So really, this is sort of the next step that we want to go for: is actually first detecting these systems, and then obviously to characterize them. We really want to put these systems in their true astronomical context, and hopefully, we won't just have one of these gravitational wave electromagnetic counterparts, but we'll have tens. And so really being able to do a population synthesis of neutron star, neutron star, neutron star black hole systems and understand how binary stars actually result in these systems. And finally, I'm returning to my fiducial binary, which I showed you, that face-on binary, and showing you how having a joint electromagnetic counterpart will actually help source characterization. So here, if the short GRB is face-on, we can actually break those key degeneracies I was talking about that appear in the amplitude of the chirp, and we can measure this. We can reduce the measurement error by a factor of three. Now, today's meeting on surveying the transient universe was really focusing on making sure that we can first identify and um, detect 
the first EM counterparts at different wavelengths, the radio, the high energy, as well as the optical and the slower radio. And I'm just going to end with the observational and statistical challenges in making this happen. And so, as mentioned, we really do want to make sure we have all of the counterparts for these neutron star binary mergers to make sure we can really fit together all the information about the physics which is driving the merger. You know, do they form accretion disks? Do they form jets? And we are now in this era of time domain astronomy where there's a whole plethora of UK involved instruments actually going ahead and doing this kind of science. So for any kind of follow-up, we have to ask ourselves how many of these events do we have, how far can we detect them, and how well can we actually localise them. And so I mentioned that Advanced LIGO will be coming online this summer. When it reaches its design sensitivity, this is the volume probed by Advanced LIGO, it will be a factor of a thousand times greater than the initial versions, which you may have heard about, that ran last decade. So really you're probing a thousand times more in the volume. Because remember I said we're measuring this strain, it has a one over distance to the source dependence. And so in terms of rates, that means a thousand more. So by the time it reaches design sensitivity, we expect to actually detect the mean rate is about 20 per year of these events. And typically out to 200 megaparsecs. So shown here is um, these little purple cluster things are different galaxy clusters. And so, and the scale here is 100 million light years. So to give you an idea of the scale we're talking about, we're really being, and here's the Virgo cluster. So just we're really probing um, tremendously interesting galactic distances. And if you want to talk about how well can you localize these events, well, you have to remember that these interferometers have very quadrupolar antenna functions. They're essentially all sky antenna um, an antennas that we have. And so they have very poor angular resolution. So in order to actually locate a source on the sky, you have to have a network of these detectors. You have to have two or three of these detectors at working to actually use the time of arrival to basically re-triangulate and localize your source. And to get an idea, using your angular diffraction limited angular resolution expression, um, where we're looking at frequencies which are in the kilohertz and distances between the interferometers of thousands of kilometers, we're talking about angular resolutions of about 10 degrees. Now, what I've spent quite a lot of time looking on is actually really estimating using populations of neutron star binary mergers, how well we can localize them. And one of the key aspects that I pointed out several years ago is that actually we're talking, sometimes we're not just going to localize them in one part of the sky, but we're going to localize them in huge um, non-contiguous search islands. And so shown here is a simulation um, where we're going from minus 15 to 15 degrees for a binary that's located at the origin, that's detected by three gravitational wave detectors, and the two sigma PDF for localizing this binary is a few hundred square degrees. And I remind you that the moon is a quarter of a square degree. So when your gravitational wave colleague comes and tells you, oh, I've seen the first detection, I've really reached this holy grail, and points to this part of the sky and says, you know, I've detected it. It really is that part of the sky that they will be able to tell you where to look with your optical or your radio telescope. So bear that in mind. So it's a, it is very challenging. And so we have to face the fact that we will be perhaps searching for 100 square degrees and that these optical counterparts are very faint. We've only got one tentative dis um, detection and they're also very rare. Another key aspect is that within 10 square degrees, the universe is very, very busy in the optical. So in a single snapshot, we can actually expect to see hundreds of supernova, many galactic objects such as foreground flares, dwarf nova, as well as, depending on where you're looking, many asteroids. So we're really at this point where we're trying to <coughs> pinpoint where is Wally, yes? So I grew up in England, so it is Wally. And so um, this is really the 
key challenge that we have to face, especially in the optical, is where, are we, where is our neutron star binary in that haystack, the needle in the haystack problem. And Wally here is actually in the centre of our field of view, but I don't think that will be the case for our neutron star binary. So, and really the worldwide hunt is now to make sure that we can do this by 2017, because we'll really learn key information about the ejector mass, the ejector velocity that's happening in this merger, as well as fundamental properties about nuclear astrophysics. Do all the rare, rare earth elements that we know of, as well as gold and platinum, come from there? And so in order to overcome this challenge, we at Radboud University, and my colleague Stefan is there, are building this wide field optical telescope. And it's the first dedicated telescope that will be built to follow up neutron star binary mergers, these gravitational wave sources, especially to really confront this challenge of large field of views, faintness and depth. And it's going to be built in La Silla, and phase one comprises four telescopes and it will have a cumulated field of view of 11 square degrees and essentially have five colours. So really allowing us to actually have a sort of multicoloured view of the universe. And it will perform major surveys which will really help us in this where's Wally problem, characterising the very, very fast synoptic sky for the first time, really staring repeatedly at portions of hundreds of square degrees so that we can actually understand what is transient, what is variable happening there, as well as referencing the whole sky, the whole southern sky um, in, in um, um, the first year. And then finally, of course, actually characterizing these gravitational wave events, providing us with the optical information. And then, of course, the next step in Frontier is really to also observe these radio remnants with new instruments that are coming online, for instance, the Meerkat telescope. We also have to fa similarly face challenges of poor sky localization, faintness, as well as rareness. And in terms of what we expect, all these other astrophysical systems, we don't yet know, because this is really a new frontier that's happening in the radio astronomy community, having the software capabilities, as well as the instrument capabilities to actually do this very, very fast characterization. And also the other thing that plagues us in actually hunting these down and that we've discussed today is, you know, how do you cope with the months to years time scale, when will we actually know when to look for these gravitational wave sources? Potentially they could be years after the event, but we do want to have this information because it's only through the radio that we'll actually learn about the environment as well as perhaps information about previous binary evolution history happening in the, uh, in the radio wavelengths. And so here is the challenge that as astronomers we face is really to ensure that we have these coordinated multi-wavelength observations. And this will allow us to actually witness black holes forming in real time via these stellar mergers and ensuring that we can actually have the first detections and identifications of these counterparts. And to make sure, I'm sort of ending with the next five years, to make sure that we actually are ready for the key time when we expect to see tens of gravitational wave sources happening around 2017-18, so literally in a few years. And we have this whole host of instruments in red are showing the gravitational wave detectors that are coming online all over the world. And as well as, I've just put a couple that I'm involved with, it, radio telescopes and optical telescopes, but we really have to make sure that we have all these statistical and interpretational tools to make to characterize these events as well as to actually find them. And so, and clearly in the next decade, the aim is to actually have tens of gravitational wave EM sources and to actually start to use the populations to actually do cosmology you know, using them as standard candles, as well as actually constrain fundamental physics properties such as the neutron star equation of state. So I'll end there.
Excellent. Exciting times. Thank you for a fascinating, fascinating lecture. Um, question about the advanced, not about the advanced LIGO, but the original sort of vanilla flavor LIGO. Were we expecting any detections from that instrument? Um, excellent question. Actually, so we weren't really detecting. I mean, the main challenge that we faced with gravitational wave interferometry, which I tried to um, stress, is that we have this huge uncertainty in the merger rate. Right. And so I think... It, we would have been very lucky to have seen... We would have been very lucky. Yeah. You know, we're really talking... If we're yeah. talking about the mean rate being 20 now, then, yeah. you know, you have to reduce that by a factor of 1,000 for sort of the mean rate for initial LIGO. So, yes, there was potentially the chance that in the, you know, six years or so that it was running, that they, could, they might have seen something. But I think it was very doubtful. I don't think we really... But, really understood that but you know the merger rates are really only calibrated by those known 13 systems of binary pulses that we know of such as yeah. the hulse taylor binary yeah um the actual advance isn't mm. is it a multiple of a t factor of 10 in terms of the distance because the mm. you're bouncing it back and forth between the mirrors aren't mm. you along the tubes exactly yeah. so the sensitivity is a factor of 10 and yeah. because of this one over distance because we're not measuring the flux but we're really measuring just the strain amplitude of the wave yeah um this results in this yes you know, factor of 10 to thank you very much thank you, thank you. <coughs> Uh, I didn't see anything about black hole, black hole mergers. Do you expect to see any? And if so, would they have any electromagnetic signature, for instance, due to disruption of local material or, or some second order effects? So that's an excellent question, and I didn't talk about potentially, I mean, I talked just really about the guaranteed sources, neutron star mergers, and I really focused on those because they have, we know at least one of the components has matter. So we do expect some matter outflow from these systems because the merger is so messy in that extreme <coughs> curvature time. For binary black holes, um, for supermassive black holes, yes, we do expect electromagnetic counterparts, but they happen at a very different frequency range, sort of the millihertz frequency range as opposed to the kilohertz frequency range. And we need to actually have space-based gravitational wave interferometers. You may have heard of something called LISA which was designed to really um, detect those supermassive <coughs> black holes. So stellar mass black holes, um, it's, for, it's doubtful that there will be an electromagnetic counterpart. But, but yes, they are very much a strong source, an anticipated source by advanced LIGO. And especially because in that frequency range, you'll really um, detect the final orbits you know, in just before they merge. So you're really in this strong field gravity machine for the binary black hole case. And then you can actually test GR fundamentally there. <laughs> So I think perhaps we'd better move on, but not long to wait. Thank you very much. Thank you.